All right, we will, we will start the uh, uh, item E17, public reading of the proposed 2020 budget by the clerk. Marathon County notice of public hearing of the consolidated 2020 proposed budget. Summary, residents and taxpayers will take notice that the Marathon County Board of Supervisors has arranged for a public hearing on the 2020 tentative budget to be held in the Marathon County Assembly Room at the Marathon County Courthouse, Wausau, Wisconsin. An official public hearing is scheduled for Tuesday, November 12th, 2019 at 8 p.m. with final approval on Thursday, November 14th, 2019 at 7 p.m. The public hearing will be for the benefit of Marathon County taxpayers who desire to be heard. The following is a summary of the tentative 2020 budget. Public inspection of the detailed report may take place at the Office of the County Clerk or the Finance Department. Proposed for 2020, tax levy is $50,711,295. Mill rate is 4.7160. Equalized value is $10,753,132,800. All right, I declare the public hearing open and uh, invite uh, the public to comment. And we have first on the uh, uh, list of individuals that have already uh, noticed that they wanted to discuss uh, the, the, or at least a comment on the uh, budget. We have Brett Barker, uh, Bill Bertram, and Dwayne Zamzo on the Historical Society. I'll be the one speaking tonight from the Marathon County Historic Site. First of all, uh, we, gave, we had two handouts that uh, one later has some of the highlights that I'll let you look at later, but there is a map I will be referring to if you'd like to look at that. Um, good evening. I'm here tonight to speaking on behalf of the Marathon County Historical Society. I'd like to take a few minutes to explain how the society's programs, er, 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 programs reach every corner of the county and how your financial support helps us do that. You have before you a map showing where our programs have been held and which school's classes have come to Wausau to spend a day at our Little Red Schoolhouse. First, the blue stars. Each represents a site where we, pre we presented a program, talk, or event in the last two years. Partnering with local libraries, schools, and other community venues, we have offered talks on a wide range, wide range of historical topics, many of them by request and all of them tailored to the interest or local history of the place. Our History Speaks in Your Town lecture series has presented programs in many parts of the county, including Athens, Edgar, Spencer, Mosinee, the Mead Wildlife Area Headquarters, and Hatley, to name a few. We've continued to find creative new ways to reach every part of the county and give our county's residents the opportunity for education and cultural enrichment where they live. The red stars on the map represent classes of school children who have participated in our Little Red Schoolhouse. One of our signature programs that allows fourth graders to step back in time and spend a day going to school as their grandparents once did any one-room schoolhouse. It makes history real for them and in some instills a lifelong love for exploring the world of previous generations. We are passionate about telling not only the larger stories of our nations and local and state history, but also docu documenting and sharing the history of life in this county. From the dairy farmer near Colby, to lumberjacks near Naugert, from the Pomeranian settler near Berlin, to the railroad workers who once kept a tiny but important line operating between Stratford and Halder. Whether it's the brick works at Ringel, or a Polish farmer and his family in the town of Easton, or among ginseng harvester near Mosinee, we remain committed to preserving and sharing the history of everyone who has ever called Marathon County their home. All of these programs come at a cost, and that is where your continuing support has been so vital. The board recognizes the need to reach beyond the Woods and History Center in Wausau, yet such programming is more expensive and requires significant staff resources. In 2018 alone, we responded to 121 requests by groups for programming and held 91 major programs and events outside our walls. We also now pay all of the costs of the Little Red Schoolhouse after years of financial support from Altrusa 
ended in 2017. We are the key institution that is relentlessly and cost-effectively connecting Marathon County with its past, and your financial support makes it possible for us to deliver quality programming to every part of our county. Without that funding, we will find it difficult, if not impossible, to continue to have such a wide reach. We have demonstrated our commitment to making the Marathon County Historical Society a truly countywide force that shares the lessons and stories of the past with this and future generations. And we need your continued financial commitment to help us carry on our critical mission. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Ruth Heinzel. And the topic uh, she wishes to speak on is the DA's office. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for granting me the opportunity to address the county board about the diversion program and making this a consideration in determining the county budget. My name is Ruth Heinzel. I grew up in Marathon County in the nice little town of Texas. Um, I have been working in the diversion program for nine years, the last four years in the district attorney's office. Diversion is when an individual is diverted into some form of rehabilitation program instead of going through the tr traditional criminal justice system. Diversion allows individuals the opportunity to repair harm and obtain more natural consequences instead of going through the tr traditional punitive process of the criminal justice system. In Marathon County, currently over 600 individuals participate in the diversion option each year. We are the largest diversion program in the state of Wisconsin, even larger than Milwaukee. Out of these 600 cases, approximately 250 are pre-charged diversion cases, which mean the offender signs an agreement prior to even being charged. Every individual going through the Marathon County court system deserves the opportunity to be meaningfully considered for diversion. However, due to the current staffing crisis in the district attorney's office, this, this is not happening. It is imperative that prosecutors have more time when determining whether or not an individual is appropriate for diversion. If a prosecutor is not allotted the appropriate amount of time and resources to consider all factors of a case, before making a charging decision and whether or not to refer them to diversion, it can have detrimental outcomes for the defendants and the victims. This is also important when considering the benefits of diversion. Out of the approximate 350 individuals offered post-charge diversion options each year, if an attorney had more time when reviewing these cases, many of these people could have been offered a pre-charge diversion option, greatly changing the trajectory of their lives and the lives of their families. This would also take low-risk first-time offenders out of the traditional criminal justice process, saving the county hundreds of thousands of dollars and speeding up the court process for the moderate and high-risk offenders. The one thing that I ask you to keep in mind tonight is to ask yourself why. After completing Marathon County's leadership development program, there were two main concepts that I use every day. The first one is to always ask why, and the second is to take the time to collaborate when possible. Keeping this in mind, another county initiative that I am involved in is evidence-based decision-making, where we use well-researched evidence-based programming and processes when making system changes to help make sure we are making the most effective and most efficient decisions for Marathon County. The evidence-based information that is taken into consideration today is from the Wisconsin Department of Administration. The well-researched formula determines the appropriate prosecutor caseload for each county. Marathon County is currently one of the most understaffed district attorney's office in the state of Wisconsin with a need of 5.7 prosecutors. Using evidence-based decision-making, the district attorney, Ms. Whetstone, should be in front of you today asking for 5.7 attorney positions and additional support staff to support these positions. This would be the best thing for her office and Marathon County as a whole. However, she is asking you to keep the money allocated to the 2.5 positions previously funded by the county as promised in the 2017 resolution. Again, ask yourself why. Why are we not collaborating as a county to find out how to make sure our departments that are mandated, mandated by state law are appropriately staffed? 
Please support the Marathon County District Attorney's Office by returning the funding to fund an additional prosecutor and legal assistant. This is necessary for the diversion program to work the best way that it can and speed up the court process by clogging the criminal justice system with low level first time offenders, resulting in more savings for the county. Thank you. We have Kyle Mayo. Good evening. Again, my name is Kyle Mayo. I'm both a homeowner here in Marathon County and one of our assistant district attorneys. At the end of this month, I'll have worked in Marathon County for seven years. When I was first hired here in November of 2012, I knew very little about Marathon County. All I knew was driving through on Highway 59 or 51, 39, up to my family's cabin. My mindset at that time was I'd work here for a couple years, wait for an opportunity to open up in the southern part of the state, and move back down closer to family. However, after moving here and living here, I've learned how great Marathon County is. This community has grown on me so much, I no longer have any desire to leave, bought a house, and am committed to staying. This community has great events, both in the summer months and in the winter. One of our most important assets in this county is public safety. Public safety in this county starts with the work that our men and women of law enforcement do every single day. The district attorney's office is also a large portion of public safety within this county. I'm here to urge you to support the district attorney's request for additional prosecutor and support staff. Over my almost seven years here, I've seen many assistant district attorneys come and go. In April of 2018, when I had five and a half years of experience, I became the third most senior person in our office behind District Attorney Whetstone and ADA Brubaker. Five and a half years out of 11 people, I was the third most senior. Currently, I have seven open homicide or attempted homicide cases within our office. Seven years of experience, seven very significant cases. Those are on top of my assigned caseload, which fluctuate, fluctuates between 400 and 420 open felony drug cases. I'm currently assigned to the felony drug trafficking cases. Delivery of controlled substances, possession with intent to deliver controlled substances, and overdoses, both fatal and non-fatal. As the drug prosecutor, I work with the Special Investigations Unit and the Central Wisconsin Narcotics Task Force, the new task force that was just created. I review warrants, answer questions, and discuss investigations with them. That's all hours of the day, all hours of the night. They know they can call me if they need a warrant or if they have questions. Earlier, uh, we had the cemetery incident. That day, we had scheduled to have a press conference in this room with state, local, and federal partners to announce a, a methamphetamine investigation that had concluded. Instead of having that press conference here, I, along with DA <coughs> Whetstone and another prosecutor, spent the day in our conference room and out at local police departments doing warrants because of that, that incident. Others in our office then had to pick up my court time and our other court time so that we could work on those. Because of the way the office is situated and the number of people we have, I'm assigned to all five branches in Marathon County Circuit Court. That means I have to schedule status hearings, pretrials, jury trials, motion hearings, preliminary hearings in every single branch. It's not feasible. One person can't be in all five branches. But because of our numbers and our number of assistant district attorneys, that's the way it has to be for myself and for our traffic prosecutor. Many of the individuals on my caseload are either in federal or state prison or in our local jail. Oftentimes, they file speedy trial demands. That means that we have to have a trial within 90 days from that request. The reality of that is I'm scheduling trials on consecutive days in different branches. 
or on bumping trials that have been set for months in order to get those trials on. My cases often involve Facebook downloads or cell phone downloads of evidence that I have to review. Those can be from just a few hundred pages to thousands of pages. If I go to trial, I have to know what's in those pages because the defense attorney is going to know and when my witnesses are on the stand, they could ask them a question, one line out of one page on there. I have to be aware of that and know that along with body cams, squad cams, everything else that the attorney Whetstone told you about. <laughs> we have to know all that. The preparation for jury trials often occurs on nights and weekends. I don't only work nights and weekends preparing for jury trials. It's a reality in my life and my coworkers' lives. There are very few weekends that go by that I don't do some sort of work just to do my daily job. There isn't enough time in the day with our caseloads to adequately prepare our cases for the citizens of this county. Thank you for letting me speak, and I hope you see that there is a human side and you'll support the funding for the district attorney's office. Thank you. Um, the next was uh, the Marathon County Literacy Program. Uh, Hi, my name is Connie Heideman, and I'm the executive director of Micklet. Marathon County Literacy Council, Inc. We are a 501c3. We were reestablished in 2017. In the short time I've been with Micklet, we have reestablished our position at the Marathon County Public Library. We've grown into more spaces with the help of the Salvation Army, the Hmong American Center, as well as going to many businesses in our county. Our services to help the homeless, the poor, the underemployed, the high risk, those that are in most need, trying to become more successful in changing their quality of life. We do this through literacy, whether it's in reading and writing or ESL or math. We also help with financial literacy, health literacy, and job performance knowledge. We work at the Community Corner Clubhouse, Marathon Ginseng, Everest School District. We collaborate with many of the nonprofits, such as Open Door, Catholic Charities, the Joseph Project. We had heard earlier how important it is to do the follow-up behind some of the really great projects. We follow up behind the Joseph Project. This has been our first group that we're following behind, and we have already kept twice as much retention rate as the previous programs. We will continue working with Joseph Project. Their next group is coming up in the beginning of December. We work with Lena Start. And after the parents and the children get through the program, we follow through if the parents are having their own issues in reading and guiding their children, we are there to support them all of the way. We work with Neighbors Place. We work wherever there is a need for literacy. I would like to enter, well, okay, this is what I was supposed to say. I'd like to introduce, I had a couple volunteers that were gonna do testimonials. They live at the shelter and they can't be out this late at night, so they're back in where they have to be. I had a special needs person that I was gonna let talk for a couple seconds, and she fell asleep in the back room, so she's gone. So um, we're, we're losing our, I had two board members, they both have to go to work tomorrow, and then I had a really good testimonial of somebody that's learned our language really well and got a job and is doing really great, and she had to go to work. So now you just get the staff, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm a 100% volunteer. This is my staff. Um, we just got a grant from Walmart. We bought a um, literacy-based, Wisconsin literacy-based database through the Wisconsin Literacy Program. These guys have been working so hard and so diligently to try to get you some stats. Remember, we've only been around for two years, so we don't have a lot of numbers to work with. 
and they had to enter everything from scratch. So they have been working very hard. And on top of that, I asked her to go through it rather quickly because we're all getting tired. But this is Aaron, and Aaron's going to go through some of the papers. Hopefully, they'll be in your packet tomorrow, but right now, you just have the paper copies. We also have a letter um, from Greenheck, who has already given us a grant, and we're asking for $5,000 from the county to match the Dudley Foundation grant, which that letter is also going to be in the packet. Aaron? Hello, my name is Aaron. I'd like to draw your attention to the Cumulative Program Statistical Report. So on the first page, you see the overview that um, the Achieve show to database shows us. We currently have, um, or as of um, the sixth of this month, we have 87 active learners, 40 volunteers, 11 active learner volunteer pairs, and six active classes. Our locations, as Connie said, include Salvation Army, Marathon County Public Library, Hmong American Center, and a new um, location in Marshfield. And we also have other programs, um, Community Corner Clubhouse, Marathon Ginseng, and PEP. On the next page, um, I'd like to draw your attention to the graph that says growth. I think this is a um, really good representation of how we have grown. So this graph shows um, we've grandfathered over um, some students 2015, 2016 that are still current in our program. And um, we've gained in 2017 when we were reestablished 11 new learners. The next year, 27 new learners. And this year so far in 2019, 115 additional new learners. So we're growing pretty fast and our needs are getting bigger. Um, we have, of those learners, uh, we have 67 adult basic education learners, 16 English language learners, and 10 that are on the GED or HSED track. You can see some of the goals of our learners, the most important goals are, of course, improving academic and literacy skills. Um, some of secondary goals or primary goals for our learners are to obtain their GED or a HSCD, um, obtain employment, or obtain housing. At our Salvation Army office, we often help um, people do housing searching um, with our, the computers that we have there. On the third page, Um, most of the learners we serve um, are in Marathon County. We have a few learners that are in follow-up, um, one in Winnebago, and we have a few um, that we reach out to in um, Lincoln County. And in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see that 39% of our learners do not have a high school diploma or GED or HSED. And these are the people that we are helping. Of our volunteers and tutors, most of them are tutors. We have um, 30 active tutors. Um, the work status of our, most of our volunteers are retired at 37%. And the majority of our volunteers are female and of retirement age. Um, you, here you can also see that the growth of our volunteers has also grown pretty exponentially. This year we have um, 29 new volunteers that we have recruited and I think there's another three or four files sitting on my desk to add to that. So it's gonna keep growing by the end of 2019. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to share with you. Thank you. Uh, and I have to apologize. Uh, I did skip over, and I did not mean to. Davis Rundy uh, also from uh, speak about the uh, DA's office. So I know some people are 
looking at paper and um, looking at their screens. I would just ask that you uh, pay attention to what I have to say here tonight. Um, I'd also like everyone in the room, members of the board and the public to close their eyes for me. Go ahead. Thank you. I want you to picture in your head a 14-year-old girl, blonde hair, green eyes, sweet and innocent. I want you to picture her meeting her biological father for the first time. She's so happy and excited to finally have this relationship with her dad. He tried his best to stay in contact with her mom, wanting to know how the girl was growing up, checking in every six months or so. One day after asking about her father, the girl's mom decides to allow them to meet. And there was no reason for them not to meet. There was no concern. It was just that he was an absent father. and um, He was absent for the first part of her life. They meet for the first time at a fast food restaurant where they talk and get to know each other. They leave and say goodbye. The girl is still happy. In the coming weeks and months, her relationship with her father blossoms. He's texting her, asking how she's doing, etc. They even began to have some visitations with one another. Things were seemingly going well. She had remarked to her mother around this time how happy she was to finally have met him. One day at her house, he was over. They were enjoying their time together. They were in the kitchen alone while the other children were outside playing. He has her sit on a stool. Next, out of nowhere, he takes off her pants. He starts to digitally penetrate her vagina. He then kneels down and he starts to lick her vagina. Perched on her stool in the kitchen, the girl watches her young, younger siblings play outside as her father sexually assaults her. She notices how he's trying to make eye contact with her from below and she avoids his glare. After she is assaulted in the coming weeks and months, her father introduces her to cocaine, marijuana, and methamphetamine. They have sexual intercourse multiple times over. He sends her pictures of his erect penis. He asks her if it's wrong that he is sexually attracted to his daughter. He purchases a dildo for them to use with each other. This little 14-year-old innocent girl comes forward to the Child Advocacy Center in Wassa and discloses that information to total strangers, trusting they will treat her with respect and protect her. If you haven't done so already, please open your eyes. I was one of those strangers that she disclosed that information to. I assume all of you are hoping that I made that up, that this was just for show, and that these things could, possibly not, not, could not possibly happen in our community. Unfortunately, I did not make that up. Instead, when I interned with the district attorney's office, that was the first child interview I attended. I still think about that case, which is now closed, and the father is in prison. I spared you many of the details she shared with us that day. We are not spared those details, and every day we have to hear those details. That is the reality of our position. We deal with the unimaginable. And the type of sexual assault I just described is something we routinely see in our position. My name is Davis Rundy. I'm an assistant district attorney here in Marathon County. I grew up in Wassa. I never knew that this happened in my community. I work alongside some of the hardest working members of this community. Every single one of us in the DA's office can say that we have spent nights and weekends in this building preparing not for trials, but just normal work weeks. And those nights and weekends are not anomalies, they are commonplace. That is the time commitment demanded from us. We arguably commit more time to this county and this community than any other agency and work tirelessly to carry out our jobs to ensure the safety of this county. There are 11 of us, 11 of us to prosecute thousands and thousands of cases. That in and of itself is a crisis. That makes our office a triage center. Unable to prosecute effectively and appropriately, this workload and need for relief is known by each and every one of you. That is not news. That is not why I'm here tonight. I'm here to tell you 
what working in the office is actually like because if you haven't done it, you have no idea. The real emotions and stress that go into it. Imagine being responsible for prosecuting that young girl's father and on top of that having 500 other open cases. That is the reality of our position. I started at this office when I was 26 years old. I know I look like I'm 16. I'm 28 now. 26 years old, fresh out of law school, a homicide prosecutor. Eight months in to my position, District Attorney Whetstone came into my office and said, ready to go to a homicide? I was not. But I grabbed my coat and my little black book that I had used when I was an intern to compile notes of criminal procedure and law. And we go to the scene. We arrived, and while we're walking up to the tape, DA, DA Whetstone again says to me, are you ready? I said, I guess, even though the 15 minutes of time that had passed since the last time she asked me wasn't enough time to make me ready to see my first murdered body. We walk up to the garage the body is laying in. I can see the frozen blood pooled around the man, laying face down, the brain matter and skull fragments, the holes in his head from being bludgeoned, and the case starts. No time to process the emotions of that scene. Instead, it's investigation time. We go to the police department. We're briefed on the information that they have, and we start working. That was at 10.30 a.m. approximately. We left the next morning at 2.30 a.m. Prior to leaving the police station, the decision had to be made whether we had enough information, enough evidence to go arrest our suspect who was not in the area, but rather another county. Initially, that county sheriff's department had agreed to do an interagency assist in the event the suspect would not agree to voluntarily interact with the police. So as a 26-year-old child of a prosecutor, I had to make a decision on whether I would approve a search warrant and an arrest warrant for our suspect. I did this in conjunction with DA Whetstone, but it was unequivocally, unequivocally an equal decision. We had a private conversation away from law enforcement and had commiserated on the situation we found ourselves in. At its core, that decision is a legal one. It's easy to think, oh, well, you have probable cause, go arrest him, do it. But are you sure it's the right decision? Are you sure your analysis is correct? Are you so sure of your analysis that you're gonna send police officers in there with tactical gear to risk their lives to apprehend that person? Are you gonna risk the life of that suspect who might not even be the correct person? Earlier I had mentioned the other county sheriff's department. They backed out of that risk. That's not to demean them. This was not their case, not their suspect, not their personnel, why risk their lives? So at 2.30 in the morning, I and DA Whetstone set out, sent out our law enforcement officers with their SWAT team to go risk their lives and physically remove a homicide suspect who was holed up in his house. That was a decision we made to risk lives in pursuit of justice. Justice for the family that hours earlier we met saw the fear and sadness in their eyes. You cannot imagine the pressure that you feel when you have that decision to make. And the reality of our office is that it doesn't matter how much experience you have. We are all expected to make that decision, to be able to make that decision, because there's nobody else who can do it. We have to answer the bell. It doesn't matter. The 11 of us make decisions every day that affect hundreds of members of this community, and we all struggle with whether those decisions are the right ones. So you have to ask yourselves, are you comfortable with a 26-year-old making a call about a homicide case? Do you feel safe with that reality? It will not offend me if you say no. I don't feel safe with it. You shouldn't feel safe. That situation I find my, found myself in is the situation mistakes are made in. With inexperienced prosecutors handling cases that are bigger than them, that is not to say I'm not capable, I am. But there's a reason DA's offices in bigger counties with the resources and the manpower have 
teams dedicated only to homicide cases. <coughs> they're comprised of senior attorneys who know what they are doing, but not in this county, because we have not been given the staff or the resources to adequately handle our cases, and we still do not have that, regardless of the state stepping up and finally funding something that you guys were funding for us. We're still at 12 attorneys, 5.7 attorneys short of where we should be. We work our tails off to do the absolute best we can for all of you. But that does not mean we are perfect. We are far from it. In a system that demands perfection, it takes a serious toll on the level enough to do right by our victims and our community and you. I dream about seeing that victim's body. I dream about children being sexually assaulted and beaten. That is because of what I experienced in the DA's office. And when I wake up in the morning, I try to do the best I can to do something about it. I have a victim's name taped to my desk downstairs to remind me of why I do this job. That victim has suffered the absolutely utmost horrific things you could imagine. And I want nothing more than to work solely on her case and make sure I do right by her and protect her because she deserves that and it's heartbreaking and anxiety inducing and awful that I know that I simply cannot devote the time to her case that she deserves. So to make up for it, I dedicate weeknights and weekends to not only her case, but also the 500 other cases that I have pending, half of which have their own victims who also deserve all the time I can give and all the respect they deserve. In the melee of our work days, we lose sight of the human aspect of our jobs. And to survive, I have to dehumanize the case and turn it into numbers. Because if you take on the emotion and the reality of each and every case, I have no doubt you would crumble. It's simply too much to bear. That is what's called burnout. Each and every one of us in the DA's office is burnt out. But we keep going and we keep fighting because we know it's the right thing to do and we do it in the face of state and county budget makers who tell us to suck it up because something else, assumingly more important, needs money. I do not know how that is possible. It is unacceptable. In preparation for tonight, I struggled a lot with what to say to you. And the stories I could tell you to make you think that funding our office is an absolute necessity. But the fact is, you, you all know this already. You've known this for years, the public has known this for years, but we are still relegated to the basement of this building with our leaky windows and mice to handle all the carnage, brutality, and sadness that occurs in this county. We are not thanked, we are likely not even thought of, which allows the members of this board and the members of this community to sleep better at night while I, while I sleep with the dreams described earlier. We are assigned that pain and that trauma and we do you the service of handling it and protecting you so you don't have to think about it, so you don't have to address it. We talk about it all the time, how hard it is for juries to understand the reality of a child being sexually assaulted by a family member because they simply cannot comprehend that it would happen in real life. They do, and in Marathon County it happens weekly. And you have 11 people to handle it. 11 people working to ensure that those perpetrators are held accountable through the court system. Doesn't that scare you? 11 people? We do not have the time. We do not have the resources. It's shocking that we have the mental ability alone to even compartmentalize our day-to-day -day operations. But the warriors that are my coworkers do it, and we do it really well, actually. I'm proud of of each of us and the work we do because it's the most valuable work that happens in this county. When you hear about people making the decisions we make, the common phrase is, well, that's why you get paid the big bucks, right? I assure you, we do not get paid the big bucks. We do not request higher salaries or more benefits. All we request is more time. And the only way we get more time is through another position with more, another worker who can help lift our load. Please fund us, please help us. 
there's not enough time to address all the issues that plague our DA's office, such as how the turnover creates massive backlogs of cases which cause this county extreme amounts of wasted resources, or how lives are limited by our jobs, unable to or deterred from starting families. I cannot comprehend how Teresa, Molly, Ruth, Paul, Rory, how they have families, how they keep it afloat. I just got a puppy and I can't handle it. The only thing I'll point out, which Administrator Carter pointed out earlier, is somehow there's a priority about doors and windows going on right now. And that if you don't address the doors and windows, that could cause problems and more expensive fixes in the, later down the road. How is that a priority over the DA's office and the crisis we are facing? That's a joke. The simple fact is, is that we are drowning. And if you, did, if you deny our request, you are denying us a spot on the lifeboat. The mission statement that is staring you all in the face means nothing except for this, some kind-hearted sentiment that you do not actually stand by. This is a decision you can make to fund us, to help us, to keep this community safe. And I ask that you do that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, that was the number of people that had signed up. Is there anybody else from the public that wishes to address the board on the budget? Please come forward. And if you would please state your name and address. Uh, good evening, Jane Graham Jennings, 3200 Hilltop Avenue in Wausau. Um, thank you all. It's been a long evening and a late night. Uh, you saw earlier there were a number of people here in this room who may have felt compelled to address you. They all also had to go home to their families. Um, so I just wanted to again, I was here last month explaining in detail um, the work that the women's community does and listening to the district attorney's office talk about their needs and their trauma, we experience very similar things. We do a lot of the same work that most people don't really know what it is that we do. So we're, we're saving lives. And I was listening to people talk about and hearing some thoughts around the cuts that they're talking about, Jane, it's only 25%. It's only $13,000. And for some people, $13,000 may be an only. But for us, it's everything. We operate on an absolute shoestring budget. If you want to see efficiency, go to a nonprofit. We will show you how to figure out how to get everything you need from a penny. For someone who has $100, $25, is a lot. For someone who has $1,000, $25 isn't much. So when you think in this scale, it's not that big deal. It's only this percentage of your budget. That's $13,000 that I have to figure out where to fit into my already overtaxed schedule to raise those funds. I have to operate the entire agency have to supervise 32 staff. We have to serve an entire community. We don't get to choose who comes to our agency. We don't charge fees for what we do. We have no income revenue stream except for grants and kind-hearted donations and fundraising. $13,000 is a really big deal to us. And ultimately, the plan is to eliminate $55,000. That's what it ultimately would be. That's two additional fundraisers I would have to figure out how to make happen. I really hope you'll consider reinstating funding to the women's community because we save lives in this community. 
we are part of the safety net that exists for our citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to address the board on uh, any issue on the budget? Any other individuals? Anybody else? Well, if there's no one else, I will um, declare the uh, closing of the public hearing. And uh, we will move on to discussion by board members regarding the proposed 2020 budget. I open it up. Supervisor Stark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll make it brief. Uh, I, in the packet on page, um, I think it's 171. Um, is the resolution that I'm going to be proposing to amend the budget with respect to the district attorney's office positions that were requested. And in the uh, resolution, I make reference to having that funding come from the start right budget um, as a uh, reduction there and a transfer into the district attorney's office to fund these positions. I'm not gonna go into uh, a lot of numbers because the, the numbers that uh, the D district attorney's office provided, I think speak for themselves. I did provide on everybody's desk a, a one page document that's two sided, that's got statistics that were provided to me by the district attorney's office that support reasons why this should be uh, done. And lastly, when uh, asked why start right, when I look at the overall budget and Yes, I do believe Start Right is an important resource, but in, in saying that, uh, the funding for that service is actually in some respects supplemental to other uh, money that they're getting. They, the, the people that are in that program, they have to be in WIC, they have to be in Medicaid, so it's not like if we cut this amount of money from their budget, that their whole system's gonna collapse. I'm not saying stop, start right, abandon stop right, start right rather, I, I'm saying we, we can make this um, cut and, and not completely devastate or destroy the program. And um, so uh, I think some of the statistics that were provided by uh, Joan, uh, they, with 25 years, of being in this program, I would have expected harder numbers. And th there are numbers that are kind of speculative, in my view. Um, so I, I ask that you review the, the document that I provided and the resolution. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to discuss it uh, at any time. And I'll be submitting this for a vote at the Thursday meeting. Thank you. Hey, any other discussion? Supervisor Robinson. I'm working on a, a amendments relative to the nonprofits uh, in uh, debating whether to separate out quartile three from quartile four, um, and we'll be bringing that, so look for an email tomorrow with additional clarification. Not some, not all, um, and uh, I think that they, I think we are part of a community, and as part of a community, there are partnerships and relationships that benefit us as well as the, the community itself and, and uh, whether it be culturally, um, through the women's community, through referrals, through um, North Central Community Action Program or services through the, through the United Way or job opportunities through the Environmental Boot Camp. Um, there are quality of life and important contributions that they make toward making us all better place and I would encourage you to keep an open mind for our discussion on, on uh, Thursday. Supervisor Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in the real world, so that you know full disclosure, I am the manager and facilitator of the Entrepreneurial and Education Center. Uh, the funding of the $40,000 that's called boot camp 
um, is, is a missed term that's on there. Boot camp is one of the educational programs that we use to create new, new businesses here in Marathon County. Uh, the money that the county has graciously granted uh, to the Entrepreneurial Center over the years, um, that $40,000 is just over 20% of my budget. Uh, it is all the education programs. It is all the technology because the rent and the things of the tenants cover the expenses of the, of the building. Um, I feel all along that the nonprofits, the people that get up and speak and stuff are extremely needed and um, in our community to make us a better place uh, to meet with our mission. But I've felt all along that um, because I happen to work for a nonprofit 501c3. We're looped in with these nonprofits. We're a 501c3 by definition, but um, we are one of the only economic development programs that this county board funds, helps fund for economic development. And over the past two years, Every time someone wanted to, to put something out there as to why a new program, why something was needed, we had to have a better look, a better feel for Marathon County, it was, oh, it'll hurt economic development if we don't do this, or it's good for economic development if we do this. Um, we as a county board, I've always felt the county should be the focal point of economic development. The community should all be um, directed through the county, but I don't think that's ever going to happen. But again, besides McDevco and the Entrepreneurial and Education Center, I challenge any of you to come up with any dollars that this county spends on true economic development. And over the past eight years, we have helped start over 330 new LLCs or nonprofits in Marathon County. It's a regional program for the county. And um, the fact that I don't think we should be categorized with these other programs is irrelevant. Um, I, I, I can't say um, we should fund the programs that I want versus the district attorney's office or the women's community and things. Uh, those are critical things, but again, don't keep coming back saying, we need this for economic development. We need this to attract new professionals here for economic development. If at the heart of it, this county board can't put some money where their mouth is and, and really have some programs for economic development uh, along with supporting these other nonprofits. So I hope we come up with something. I'd sooner have the mile of county road in front of my house not repaired for the next five years if it's going to give us enough money because fewer people are affected by driving over that damn road than the people that are saved through these these programs that these nonprofits put out there. I mean, if you own a car, it's not as critical as if you're walking. And the people that um, these nonprofits are helping, that the DA's office are helping, are not even walking, they're crawling. Um, they're the people that need the help in the community. So. Um, whether or not that makes sense to you. Um, I hope we can come up with a way to fund uh, these things. And I would suggest even that um, so roads don't get fixed every 11 years instead of every 10. Um, fewer people use the roads that can afford to use the roads than the people that these nonprofits really help that need help right now, every day. Thank you. Supervisor Rosenberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm glad you mentioned some of those statistics. During this budget cycle, um, I've been going around talking to a lot of different nonprofits and departments. I've talked to the DA's office. I've talked to Romy, the, the 330 LLCs that he's created through the, the Entrepreneurial Center is pretty amazing, and that's real economic development that affects families here. Um, there are a couple things I wanted to mention, though. Um, 
and it especially comes down to the nonprofit stuff. There are three specifically that really, it feels like if we start defunding them, we're kind of hitting at the bedrock of what we're supposed to be doing as, as, as a county, um, and it's just not doing the right thing. The number one right now, um, just because it's the first one on my list here, is uh, NCAP. Um, you know, they have been doing a lot to help with the homelessness problem in central Wisconsin. And um, I know we all can't be at every budget hearing and every meeting, but today at the city council, they've um, changed, and they've created an ordinance to, um, it's an anti-loitering ordinance for the city ramps, um, but one of the effects it has is on homeless people. And NCAP is one of those programs that steps in and says, you know what, ho housing first, we can, we can get you out of this problem of not having a place to live, and then hopefully we can get you into you know having a job and being able to contribute to society. So I think it's it's short sighted for us to um, cut this program, um, and especially cut it all the way down in the next four years. And you know it's one of those things that also relies on uh, funding. So the funding they get from us they match. Uh, so it's really you're cutting them twice. Um, the other one I really care about a lot here tonight is the women's community. We've heard from them. Um, it's critical that people who are in abusive situations, dangerous, dangerous scenarios, um, you know, we're talking a lot about trauma tonight. This is one of those programs that helps women especially, um, but families get back on their feet, be safe, find the right resources they need. Again, we, we cannot be cutting these programs. And then United Way 211, this is one of those things that actually keeps um, those calls from coming into the county. They've, <coughs> we should probably be contracting for services with them. And actually, maybe with a lot of these nonprofits, we should be looking at how we're actually, we're not just giving them a donation, we're saying, hey, this is what we expect you to do. Here are the outcomes we wanna see. Um, we would like to pay you for these services. I think that's probably the better approach here. Um, and then finally, I just can't disagree more with, um, kind of swapping out the trauma <laughs> that we would be doing with getting rid of Start Right or defunding some of that program within the trauma that we're seeing the DA's office deal with. I think we've gotta find a better solution there. Um, I hear you, I hear you, I know you need the funding. I know that we gotta figure something out, especially with our state partners. Um, but I just can't see, I mean, we're gonna pay now and we're gonna pay later if we make this swap, so. I just, I don't know where we're at. I think we gotta figure something else out though. Supervisor Zhang. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I concur with um, Supervisor Rosenberg, I, but um, the main point of my uh, remarks here is I guess I have a question directed specifically to Supervisor Lowe or Supervisor uh, um, Johnson. I guess the question would be if we did let's say hypothetically the county board did decide to approve adopting the, the resolution to cut the county board in half. Is there any estimate on how much we will be saving expenses at all? I know it said that it's intended to um, to meet the need or request to fully fund the nonprofits, but how much would it actually be saving us? We've asked Christy, uh, the finance director, to look into that specific question. Uh, and so understand that uh, that would be effective uh, after the election in 2020. And so you would not have a full year of salaries for 19 supervisors less. Uh, so it would be a little bit less of a savings in 2020 and a little bit more savings in 2021. But she has a number as far as just the salaries and uh, Social Security Medicare match that is uh, uh, paid to the 19 supervisors. The savings is $80,845. That would be 2020. And then uh, roughly, Christy, it was 135,000 uh, the subsequent year, uh, subsequent years, based on the current salary structure. Right. Thank you, Supervisor Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm I'm like emotionally tired right now. Um, I I feel for everyone that has come to this meeting tonight to. Um, give their, their testimony on why they need 
you know, their funding, why the DA needs their funding, but I kind of feel like this budget, whatever, however we are going to vote, no one's going to win. We're not going to win. The DA office isn't going to win. The nonprofits aren't going to win. Someone's going to lose. So um, to my colleagues on the board, you can feel like the resolution that Supervisor Johnson and I put out might be a stunt, but I really thought it in my head that do I really want to make enemies with the historical society? Do I really want to make enemies with the women's community? No, I don't. I don't want to make enemy, enemies with any of them. It was a solution that I personally felt that we can fund our nonprofit organizations. And at the same time, we can make county board more efficient. That's the only way I thought of it. I don't want to make enemy, enemies of anyone. And so, but I feel however we're going to vote on this budget, no one's going to win. So I just wanted to let everyone know how my feelings are about this. Thank you. Supervisor Krause. Thank you, Chair Gibbs. Um, I have, um, I should say that I look forward to the day when the legislature um, makes marijuana recreational and medical legal. I think we're in a, t a tight spot right now, but if um, they go through with Governor Ears' wish or wishes to uh, legalize this, we won't have a money problem, we won't have a jail problem, we won't have over um, uh, task overworked for these people, um, and we won't ha we won't be in with this terrible painful situation, and it is painful. It's painful for everyone. Um, I, I hope that our legislature does move on this. Um, the Health and Human Services Committee uh, Chair, Matt Boots, actually uh, attended a national uh, Wisconsin, or National Counties Association, in which they were uh, trained on what uh, marijuana is going to be doing to various states and how it's helping with their budgets. And um, also the, um, uh, led the uh, National Federation of Women Legislators had at their convention um, in establishing and working towards legislation for marijuana in their states. So it's something that um, it doesn't seem that our county board wants to see happen or the state legislature, but I see it as a way out, and it's, uh, I don't see it as very dangerous. I see it somewhat harmless and it's actually beneficial for some people who have disabilities and are in pain situations and could use this, and it would cost, uh, it would help with our health uh, bills too. Um, are all our very high insurance uh, bills. Now, I do. Th I would like to see all of these non, all of the nonprofits um, get the money that they want. Um, but I have a, I have a question about the Marathon County Historical Society, and the his, the uh, museums I've gone to, except for the art museums, they charged at the door. They charge like 250, 450, something like that. They had different prices for children, and different prices for adults and seniors. So I, for the Marathon County Historical Society, I see that as a way out for them, and a, and to help if they were to do that. And I don't know if they can or not, but it just occurred to me that that might be a possibility. Thank you. Supervisor Gaber. Um, Two things that I would like to comment about uh, for the DA situation is, first of all, I had the unfortunate um, pleasure, for lack of better words, it's not right, I'm very tired, excuse me, of sitting through a court hearing with an acquaintance of mine. And the what shocked me was the judge kept saying to these jailmates that would come through, I'm sorry, I know you need 
due process, but we don't have an attorney for you. And it was one after the other, after the other, after the other. The other thing that shocked me was I have a, an employee who had gotten herself into a situation and she was jailed. Well, if it wasn't for me not only being her employer, but her landlord, because she was in jail for over three months, and at the end of it, she was innocent. So she would have lost her apartment, her job, and whatever else. And the only reason I'm bringing this up is, is because of the lack of the um, prosecuting attorneys and the DAs that were there. Now, the question I have is, and I was trying to look it up on my phone, but I couldn't find it, the amount of money it costs for us to take these jail inmates to other facilities, like this one person, I know two people that are in Medford, would that offset, because um, I think it's quite a, quite a lot of money, uh, would offset getting another DA? I didn't know. So that was just what I wanted to say. Well, to answer the question, right now the out-of-county placements uh, roughly budgeted a year is a million dollars. Uh, but uh, it, the number of decreases that we had is where we've t used that money to fund the dispatchers at this point. So the decrease from the 400 total uh, average to the, th to the 350 average uh, has been used to fund uh, part of the dispatchers. Um, and uh, the other increase that we have currently uh, that is being paid for because of the jail being under repair, that's actually coming out of reserves, so it's not even coming out of operating. It's coming out of, if you will, the cash reserve that the county has, and the county has a policy to uh, maintain X dollars in cash reserves. Super uh, Vice Chair McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I, I agree with, with the DA's office 100%. Um, they're underfunded, I mean understaffed, um, they're overworked. And, and I know they need this support from the county. Um, but in reality, the county has stepped up for many years to support the dis district attorney's office. And the, the state is, is the one that dropped the ball. Uh, they cut the position um, that, was the, that our DA thought she was going to get. Um, the timing was bad. Um, and, and she did come to public safety, the district attorney did come to public safety committee meeting, and, and we support, you know, that they need that position. However, the levy limits, um, and this goes for the nonprofits too, we, we don't have the resources. And, and like Supervisor Lowe said, I don't think any, anybody's gonna walk out of here feeling 100% happy. Um, and uh, Supervisor Rosenberg said we, we need to find another way to fund this. I'm sure the district attorney's office does not want to take resources away from the most vulnerable population we have, and those are infants. Her, her, her department deals with people that the Start Right program um, services. And, and I don't doubt the facts that Joan Thoyer had told us the effects. She's a very respectable, and, and I don't think she's fudging any of her, her numbers as far as the effects of that. She knows better than we do and we should not, and, and I'm not gonna question that. So I, I, I'm not gonna support the resolution to cut money from the Start Right program, but we do need to come up with some funds. And, and like I said, what we can come up with, I don't know, but like I said, I just don't think it's right to take resources away from the most vulnerable population that we have in Marathon County. And I know the DA doesn't want to do that. Um, so I would, I would just suggest that we look at this budget and, and try, to find up, try to find some ways to, to come up with resources for the, the nonprofits and the, and the uh, uh, start, excuse me, the Start Right program. Um, but 
like I said, it's going to get worse next year. I mean, and uh, I think Supervisor Zarini said, until the public contacts their state legislatures, legislators to tell them that these le levy limits have to be uh, removed or eased up somewhat, we're going to start cutting big things like libraries and parks, and we aren't going to have a choice. We're not going to have the money. Um, and we're at that situation right now. So, like I said, um, I, I hope we can come up with a way to, to do that, but I, I cannot support taking money away from, from the Start Right program. Thank you. Supervisor Wagner. Thank you. Don't forget, I'm serious about cutting back on a mile or two of highway and putting it on an 11-year cycle instead of a 10-year cycle. Um, it isn't something we want to do, but that young lawyer up there that said, we have to be committed to take care of the things that are critical, and I don't care what anybody says, potholes can be filled for a few more years to stretch that cycle out. Yes, for the last two years we've been talking about um, replacing them on a cycle so at 10% uh, every year. But so we stretch that out to 11 years. Uh, and, and we take that two miles or three miles that we don't do at um, whatever it was, $100,000 a mile or, or whatever. Uh, and, and that's a continuation every year. And that's not just a one-year fix for this. That's that we do, we do the less, the same amount of miles next year, which would save the same amount of money. So um, I, I want us to look at that as an obvious choice to me, as something that can be on a rotating maintenance program of 11 years instead of 10, and, and put some money up right now for some critical, critical uh, support for the DA's office, especially. The only, the only concern, I'll, I'll address just a little bit on that, Romy. Uh, you are effectively taking dollars out of uh, a program uh, this year, and that is one-time money. The fact is that next year, by adding the additional staff, you have compounded that problem to be another compounded problem next year. And this is, is actually a result of, as the administrator said, 15 years of levy caps. I've been on this board 16 years, and I have seen what the budget has done and how we have tightened the, uh, the effects of this budget. We have now, we are putting in around $2 million into CIP. At one point, we were at roughly $7 million rolling into CIP. We used to have 800 full-time employees. We're down to 750 full-time employees. Health insurance is going up in excess, in excess of the amount of levy limit we're allowed to take by the state. That's, um, that's fact. That's factual. That's, the state has not stepped up. The state is the one that set these levy limits. The state is the one that is the partner with the DA's office. And if we're a partner in a partnership, do we, do we turn around and allow the partner to just say they can't afford it and then we'll pick up the responsibility? That does nothing in the future for incentivizing that partner to ever pick up that responsibility. So I, I, I just, Point that out. Supervisor Robinson. Oh, excuse me, Supervisor Zarini was next. Thanks. I, I do, uh, I'm very concerned about the, uh, the DA's office and the, um, you know, I'm almost at a point where we need more than the, the requested amount, one more attorney, and I know that's not possible, but um, taking 10% 10, uh, 10 of the Start Rights budget seems like it's, you know, statistics that Joan presented. Uh, appeared to be catastrophic, as if the budget was being cut in half versus 10 percent. And I know she said sh they threw overhead in that in that uh, number, um, that uh, 1.2 million. But I, then I question this whole accounting process when you start throwing your overhead in it uh, as well. So I would I support the will support the proposal to uh, 
reduce start right. Supervisor Robinson. Romy, well, I'm gonna give you a little budget 101. It's called transportation aids. And I think this county has, unfortunately, in times of tight budgets, cut back on its highway maintenance dollars. In 2010, we received $3,252,849 of transportation aids. Those transportation aids are driven by a number of formulas, but most importantly, a six-year average. In 2020, we're projected to receive $3,388,202. That's after two different budgets where we've gotten 10% budget increases. We're getting, we're back where we were 10 years ago. One of the big reasons we're back to where we were 10 years ago is because every time we wanted to cut a budget, we took it out of highways. And so not only did we spend less of Marathon County dollars, we got less state dollars. Every time we cut, that cut lasted six years. We're not talking about 10 year lives, we're talking about a replacing and upgrading our highways on a 20 We were concerned. John, please. offers her insurance, she has to take her company's insurance. So it cuts that bill in half. Parks at this campground are taking a certain amount of their campground as seasonal sites. These seasonal sites are bringing $2,000 a year. I'm not sure how many sites there in the county has, but if they took half those sites into seasonal sites, campers like seasonal sites, they don't have to haul their stuff around. They might be able to pick up a couple hundred thousand or at least make the park system financially solvent. I'll just say that. Okay, seeing how the system has come along, is there any other discussion? Is there any other discussion? Most of the mics have run out of battery. I was warned that that might happen, uh, depending on how long we went. Um, so I have Supervisor Sly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Agree 100% with you, John. We can't keep taking from roads. You get, we're behind already, and the further and further you get behind, you're never catching up. And one of the other things I wanted to bring up, downsizing the county board. I guess uh, I'm totally against it. Our nonprofits are all great. We need them. How many people are represented in these nonprofits compared to how many people are the population of Marathon County? We have to represent them all. But you downsize the county board, and there is no way your rural areas are going to get adequate representation. The areas are going to be way too big. So who do we throw under the bus? Is it right to throw the people that are using the nonprofits? No. Is it right to do it to the voting public, our constituents? No. But this is not, uh, there's, I'll agree with Supervisor Lowe, this is, nobody's gonna be a winner here. But we have to do a little bit and take some of the priorities. Our, our district attorneys, oh, excuse me, are very important and they are way, way behind schedule. 
we definitely have to do something to help them out. I guess I will, I would have to support taking from the, from the first start to finance, to finance uh, the district attorneys. <coughs> and like I say, to downsize the county board, that money is not going to, what, what, it's a one-time fix this year. What are you going to do next year? Take it from 19 to 8? It ain't going to work. So I, I just, I just hope uh, we, we, uh, I hope we, we, we do not downsize the county board and some of these nonprofits, yes, do you want to cut them? No, but it takes money to buy whiskey and we got to do, do it somewheres. And I, and the nonprofits are going to be one of them. You can't do the roads. Infrastructure, that's all we hear about, business, bringing business. Infrastructure, well, that business is not going to want to drive down Grand Avenue where they had the muddles, the potholes, and we're already way behind on the roads. So it's getting late. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Supervisor Mask. Thank you. I agree with Supervisor Zeridi and Supervisor Schley on many points. And um, paraphrasing something that our administrator said in the June 2019 e-newsletter, letter, it's four hours past my bedtime. We've had a long-standing priority that requires constant attention to the rural community by making these districts so large with downsizing, the consistency will go away. Our strength in Marathon County is the mix of rural and urban, and diluting coverage of our vast rural areas gives the supervisor covering that district a huge disadvantage, um, not being able to engage with constituents at the same way that urban districts can be covered. Um, staying engaged with our municipalities, and some of us have six and five and six townships now, you're just making them bigger, and you cannot have a relationship with your district the way the urban people do. Um, I have a township that doesn't have indoor plumbing in their town hall. I have constituents who do not have indoor plumbing. And uh, it's, there's realities in Marathon County that we don't realize. Now I know that has no bearing on Start Right or no bearing on the DA's office, but you cannot take a county this size and dilute it the way it's proposed right now. Our executive committee voted to not pass this on to county board, but instead to set up a task force to study the reality of what would be done. After the 2020 um, census, the redistrict would be done anyway because populations are going to shift. It, does, it happens every 10 years. And um, I think that this is rushing into something and it's, what do they say, penny wise and pound foolish or whatever. And another thing, our divers, diversion programs that the DA's office is staffing are really important. And if they decide to stop staffing some of these diversion programs, where do you think all these people are going to end up? And I just see a downhill slide that's going to put more people in our jail. And eventually, we're going to end up building that jail. You know, it, they're like everyone is saying, there's no winners here, but you need to start thinking reality. And I don't know what that reality is, but a few bucks right now to try and keep the DA's office afloat is not going to hurt start right. But we can't keep nickeling and diming these um, organizations to death either. I think there are some nonprofits who are perfectly capable of fundraising I think the women's community is really important, one of our first lines of defense in crime and, and helping people. And Start Right is too. The historical society is very important. But I do believe that some of the organizations that are nonprofits have to start looking at ways of finding resources. I'm on the PPA board, 
And I've been telling them for over a year, start looking for different ways because funding is going to be cut. And PPA is important to Marathon County, but I think the women's community and Start Right and the DA's office are more important. That's it. I want to go home and go to bed. Thank you. Any further discussion? Any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll move on to announcements. I have just a couple of announcements. You should have at your at your uh, spot uh, at your seat uh, the proposed uh, 2020 schedule for county board meetings. Uh, there's also an announcement by the clerk uh, that uh, she has non-candidacy statements for those choosing not to run. Uh, to let her know uh, if you'd like to uh, like nomination papers uh, for Thursday. Also, uh, I received a, a very uh, well-written uh, thank you uh, uh, card from the previous clerk, Nan Kotke, uh, thanking each and every one of you uh, on this county for all of the, uh, uh, the uh, appreciation that the appreciation that was shown uh, during her retirement, and uh, uh, that will be here for anybody. I forgot, these leaves are tight with the mic. 